Next up, a man with the same name as myself, pronounced slightly differently. Big companies fight to have him on their team, whether it was as product chief of Twitter or bringing Google Maps to the iPhone, and now head of marketplace at Uber. This gentleman has an eye and is passionate for opportunities and especially for impactful projects. He's here to share a little bit. And as always, we have a Q&A afterwards. So do go to slido.com and use bit16. We've got some incredible questions coming in. So please keep coming in. So he's going to share a little bit and then we're going to take your questions. Can we please put our hands together for Daniel Graf. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Grüß Gott, Servus, Grüezi. Es freut mich, schon eher, dass ich hier da sein in München, direkt vom Badesee komme. Something's wrong with the live translation. So I'm going to go switch to English now. I thought I could use my Swiss German, that's where I'm from here. So I'll go to English. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's two hours from where I grew up, by Lake Constance. Uh, it's actually my first time at Oktoberfest, so wonderful time here. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about Uber. I'm going to ask the audience, who has never used Uber? Raise your hand. Wow, about 30% haven't used Uber. For you guys, I have a little animation what this is. And by the way, you should go straight to the App Store right now and download the app. So what Uber is, is at the touch of a button, you can get a ride uh, in most cities where we are in less than five minutes. And then you can go from A to B, very seamless. And uh, it all started when we were looking at it. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yep, perfect. Um, it all started in Germany with the car over 100 years ago. Not too many of the, on the road back then, but the car has gone through quite an evolution. We got crazy about cars over the last 100 years, and today we are used to this picture. Not always pleasant, and when we look at that, you think the Americans are crazy about cars. We have about a billion cars on the roads right now in the world, about a fifth of them uh, are in the US, but you'd think uh, all, most people use them in the US. It's actually not true. What you see here is Germany is number two. Over 500 cars per thousand people. So there's a lot of cars in Europe as well on the road. And this private car ownership, it comes at a cost, at a public cost. We saw before the traffic jam, and what that means is Germany, in Europe, has four of the 10 most congested cities. We all have been there, waiting in traffic jam. We lose, in Europe alone, about 100 billion euros per year in GDP due to traffic congestion. And when I... Trying to click technology sometimes is hard. Uh, so what I want to say also is this traffic congestion is the number two reason for pollution. It's 12% of CO2 emissions are due to private cars. And you wouldn't believe this number. Up to a third of the space in a city is due to parking spaces. Quite incredible. So. Governments are working on this, creating better public transportation, bicycle paths, and other things. The most uh, impressive innovation I've seen to fight traffic jams, and it's quite something interesting, which we could actually apply in Munich quite well. In Bruges, in Belgium, they built an underground beer pipeline to reduce traffic jams. I'm not kidding you. Hopefully next year we can see this in Munich as well. So, car, cars aren't actually the problem. It's how we are using them. Are we utilizing them enough? And the answer is actually no. And when we look at that, over 90%, 96% of the time, 
cars are sitting idle. 96%. Three quarters of Americans, they commute to work alone. They're alone in the car. And that's where Uber comes in. That's what we're working on. And I'm going to give you a few stats first. We're in over 400 cities now. We do over 5 million rides per day, have done over a billion miles per month. And what we have been trying to do is it's all through technology. And even in Germany, when you actually look at this, 45% of Berliners they're preferring to get around by car versus 22% who use public transport. And what I want to show you a little bit is we are complementing public transit. It's actually not replacing it, not at all. In many European cities, we have great public transport infrastructure, but we are complementing that. And I want to show you some interesting stats to that. This is, for example, from London. London, during a weekday morning, around 9 o'clock, over 30% of our trips, they end by a tube station, within 200 meters of a tube station. And what that means is it's very complimentary. You get from your doorstep to the tube with Uber. In Paris, we are serving all the underprivileged neighborhoods. In New York City, in the Bronx, you can get a ride within five minutes or less. That was never possible before. And so it's really complementing the, the public transport. I, I, I promise you the Uber technology works a little better than this clicker. I'm clicking and, and nothing is happening. Can we go? Perfect. Uh, here we have our mission statement. Uh, that's a very important one. It's transportation as reliable as running water everywhere for everyone. And together with my team, I'm in the technology area. We're in the marketplace team. We're responsible to provide a reliable ride. And I want to talk a little bit about reliability. What does it mean to get a ride within less than five minutes? It's not as easy as it feels as a rider. There's a lot of technology happening behind the scenes. The first thing, a little bit of controversial topic sometimes, dynamic pricing. You probably have seen surge pricing. You can blame me for that. But there's a very good reason why we do that. Surge pricing is, is sometimes when we have a lot of demand and not so many drivers in that space. So for example, here we see it in New York City around Penn Station. Then that area which you see highlighted, prices go up. What does that mean? Drivers at home notice, oh, there's higher prices. I can make more money around Penn Station, I'm going to go there, I'm going to go and drive. So dynamic pricing has helped us a lot. That's the magic behind Uber to do that. And for example, in Southern California, Kevin Spacey was talking about it. You see now the wait times, how they came down from 2013 till this year. Now, even in the suburbs, and if you have been to LA, the public transport is not that good. Now you get within less than five minutes in most areas, you can get a ride. That's all due to the technology that is powering it. And one of those levers is surge pricing. There's other levers we are using. And by the way, uh, one thing I wanted to show you is also, look at that. These are some European cities. And you see when demand goes up the highest. This is Friday night. And you can see the Dutch guys, they're partying a little longer than, than the other folks. Uh, and usually around after midnight, public transport is already closed, so we have the highest demand, so it's very complementary again. And this to make it happen, to have a, a reliable ride after midnight, search pricing helps there as well. We don't want to search, but it helps us when there is an imbalance between demand and supply. And recently we launched something, we call this uh, upfront fares, when you put in your destination, it already tells you the price. We always got feedback, oh, it's, it's searching, 1.5, 1.8, what does that mean? Is Uber hiding something? So with technology, what we could solve here is give a fare right up front, fully transparent. Another thing, this is actually quite interesting, imagine you're a driver and we have over a million drivers 
driving for Uber right now, what they go through is when they go online, first they wait, then they get a request, then they drive to the pickup, they pick up the passenger, then they drive to the drop-off, and then they repeat this again. And you can imagine which times are most interesting for a driver. It's where the passenger is in the car, where the driver where she can earn some money. So the wait time and the drive to pick up, we want to minimize that. And that's again where technology comes in. We saw surge pricing, dynamic pricing before. That's one lever where you have the right amount of cars at the right time. Another thing we did is we call this forward dispatch. It's another lever how you get efficiency up. It's all about efficiency. Uh, and what we do there is you see a car is driving to the drop off with a passenger in there. A new request comes up very close to where the passenger is. While the car is, still has a passenger in there, we already give a dispatch for the second ride. What does that mean? No wait time at all for the driver, no downtime, and a shorter pickup time as well for rider and for the driver. Another lever, what we are working on in San Francisco, we noticed a lot of people take the same trip around the same time. We're like, which you see here, why don't we pull them together? We're all used to pulling, right? When you use a bus, you're not alone in a bus. So we now in San Francisco at this stage, over 40% of our trips are Uber pool. An Uber pool is where you share with someone else around the same time, uh, the same trip. This also allowed us to lower our prices again, up to 40, 50% cheaper rides. So that's Uber pool. And what we have seen is, and that's where I come back to congestion in cities. What you see on the left is if everyone takes a trip with Uber alone, and on the right is with Uber pool, when you see the dark colors, that means there's traffic jam. You see with Uber pool, there's clearly much, much less traffic jam. Again, through technology, we were able to reduce that. And we, and we look at some numbers. This was the last seven months. Uh, we saved over 18 mil million liters of fuel, for example. So a really, really positive impact uh, on the environment here as well. And as I said before, cars are not the problem. It's the way we use them. And having more people in a car is clearly uh, better for everyone involved. And what's something very interesting in the U.S. now, in the cities in the U.S., we have... 10% of millennials, so people younger than 30, they decided, I'm not going to buy a car anymore. And that's very different, of course, from five, 10 years ago. So what does that mean for us? What, what's next for us? Technology driving this forward. You might have heard the news about two weeks ago, uh, we launched something that looks similar to this, a self-driving car uh, in Pittsburgh. We're the first company that offers commercial rides uh, for people uh, to go from A to B in a self-driving car. We are very early with this technology, and there's still a safety driver in the car, but it's very, very interesting where we can go. Let's have a look at it. Cool, huh? So that started in Pittsburgh. Here's a very sad statistic. This number, over a million people die uh, every year due to car crashes, and over 90% of those are caused due to human error. So technology is gonna make our city safer. Uh, what we're gonna see is OECD, for example, said, if we all shared cars and had autonomous cars, and again, we're speaking a few years out, we would only need 10% of the cars which we have today on the roads. That means we would get up to a third of spaces back in our cities. 
uh, it would be cheaper to move around and more efficient and hopefully traffic jams will be a thing of the past. That's what we are working on at Uber. Uh, we are excited to build that together uh, with, with governments, with the people, with the millions of riders and drivers. Thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. You got nervous, didn't you? You thought I wasn't going to like, come on stage. Now? Where is Daniel? <laughs> He's fixing the clicker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Please have a seat. Thank you. Two Daniels on stage. It can't get better than that. Um, so, question. You actually grew up, was it two hours away from here? Yeah, about two hours. Lake Constance, it's called Bodensee. Okay, and now you're in Silicon Valley. Explain a little bit behind the scenes of how you made it out there. Uh, I got an undergrad degree in Switzerland and then went for a graduate degree to the US in New York and then got infected by the startup virus. Uh, uh, did a, a couple startups myself and then uh, worked for Google. I uh, was responsible for the Google Maps consumer experience. Uh, then was at Twitter for a while and now at Uber, which by the way, people don't really believe me. We're still a startup. We're over 8,000 people, but it truly feels like a startup still. That's nice. And talking about that startup culture, as someone who grew up here and now is living in the US, where do you see the difference in the startup culture and ecosystems in Europe and in the US? I, I think it, it comes down to the American culture. And at the end of the day, America as we know it today, 200, 300 years ago, the, some crazy Europeans, the adventurers went over there, right? And, and you, what you find in America is it's, lot, it's basically what Kevin Spacey talked about. People are taking risks and it's okay to fail. I failed several times in my career as well. And, and I think we start seeing it more and more in Europe as well. Uh, for example, Berlin is becoming an amazing startup hub uh, in Europe right now because we start seeing where people are like, let's just give it a shot. What can you lose? Kevin Spacey said, let's just take the risk. Let's go for it. Yeah, and talking really practically, so just out of curiosity, how many of you are entrepreneurs in the room or founders? How many, keep your hands up, how many of you have failed along the way? Keep your hands up. Okay, uh, can someone just shout out like practically, I'm gonna ask you this as well, and we're gonna put up the uh, slide of questions that are coming in, so bit 16 for the questions. Real quick, can someone just shout out like what are practical things you can do when you fail? Because we can't just talk about building a culture that allows failure, we've gotta actually know, because we will fail. Anyone bold enough to just yell? practically what should happen? What's that? Just keep going on, good. Who else has got other advice? Learn from mistakes. Try again and try better. And coming back to you, what do you think? Like practically, what did you do when you failed early on in those startups? Uh, I think most important is really, we all, have been in a job, we feel safe about it, and it's doing that step, doing it yourself, joining a startup which is not proven yet. We're afraid of that, right? It's like, oh, can I really do this? I'm gonna lose all the security around me. Uh, you can always go back if you have to, but just make that step, and if you fall down, you stand up again. Absolutely. So it's, we're in, in, today, technology is so accessible. There's, you don't need hundreds of millions uh, to start your dream. That's not how Uber started. Today, we are massive and, 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 and of course, it takes a lot of capital, but you can start small with one or two guys. Yeah. Speaking of which, you might have a great idea, and this is a question that's up there. You might have a great idea, but convincing that first person to get on board can be difficult. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And also, do you know how Uber got their first driver on board or their first customer to download the app? Like, what's the way to do that? Um, I'm a huge fan of having a partner in crime. In my startups, I always had a partner in crime. We worked together at, also then at, at Google and other places, Eric and I, for 16 years. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, the other thing, the way Uber started is Travis and, and his co-founder, they were in, in Paris late at night once and just couldn't get a car. That's how the idea started there. And in the very beginning, uh, they were even driving themselves as well. Okay. Just experience it yourself. That's the way to do it. You gotta live it. Um, yep. We've got time for one more question. So you can either ask, uh, you can either answer, when is it gonna happen in Berlin? Or self-driving cars, ultimately, is that not gonna make drivers redundant? 
So which one do you want to answer? Uh, you probably say I should do the first one. I'll do both real quick. There we're, we we're live in Berlin. Uh, there's over a thousand cars on the road. We have partners there, so that's an easy one. Use Uber in Berlin, it's working. Uh, what, what's interesting about uh, the, the self-driving cars, first of all, this is going to be many, many years out. Uh, that's one thing. We okay. all as a society will have to learn with technology. And we, I always, I'm, I'm a proponent of embracing technology. And Henry Ford, when he created the first uh, mass, mass uh, car, uh, he basically said, if I ask everyone uh, they would have, what I should do, they would have said, uh, get faster horses, you know? And uh, what, what I say is also what, what Kevin Spacey said, is just move forward, take the risk, make that step. We have to embrace technology. There will be new jobs that, ex that will come around as well. For example, in the US, there's a, a very good comparison. Uh, when ATMs came, bank teller machines, they thought that's the end of people in local branches mm. for, for banks. The opposite happened. Banking got cheaper, so they could open more local branches actually in the bank. So I think there will be new jobs. It's also that way that we need, they will complement each other, cars that are being driven and cars that are self-driving for many years to come. Fantastic. Well, Daniel's here for the rest of the day. Are you gonna be around? So yep. do you grab him, do ask questions uh, to him. Uh, it's, we're really fortunate to have such great people who are pioneering new innovation be here at Bits and Pretzels. So thank you so much. Let's thank give you very a hand. much. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you backstage. Thank you.